Okay. Hello, and welcome to the webinar, Stack Incentives and Maximize Funding to Jumpstart Your School's Electric Bus Fleet, co-hosted by ACT News, the Bay Air Quality Management District, and Pacific Gas and Electric. My name is Brianna Lawrence, and I'm a Senior Program Manager at Gladstein and Neandros and & Associates, GNA. We are a renewable energy consulting firm in Santa Monica, and I'm looking forward to moderating for you today. School bus fleet owners know the cost of diesel school buses, as well as the cost of their maintenance and their fuel. These buses produce significant tailpipe emissions, which are harmful to the health of the student riders and our communities at large. The goal of this webinar is to inform school bus fleet owners and operators to the resources and funding available for fleet electrification, so you can save big on fueling and reduce tailpipe emissions around your schools. Next slide, please. Today, we'll be hearing from school bus funding and infrastructure experts. Claire Kelleher is a staff specialist at Barry Area Air Quality Management District. Tim O'Neill is an account executive with PG&E. And myself, a senior program manager at GNA and one of several funding gurus for incentives in California. Next slide. Before we get started, here are a few things to keep in mind as we go through each presentation. We'll have a Q&A session at the end of the webinar, and I encourage you to submit questions by using the Q&A box located in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Please direct your questions to the organizer. Some of the information that will be shared today is technical. If you'd like to watch the webinar again, the recording will be sent out by the end of the week. At the end of the webinar, before closing your browser, we kindly ask that you complete our quick 30-second survey. We truly appreciate your feedback. And for any technical issues and assistance during the webinar, please contact Benjamin at GNA using the email address on your screen. And now I'd like to present Claire Kelleher, Staff Specialist at the Bay Area Air Quality Management District. All right, thank you for the invitation to speak today and good morning, everyone. My name is Claire Kelleher and I'm the staff specialist working on the Bay Area Air Quality Management District's school bus programs. Today I'll be going over the Air District's funding, eligibility, and the application process for electric school buses and supporting infrastructure. Next slide, slide please. So here's a little background on who we are at the Bay Area Air Quality Management District. The Air District is responsible for regulating stationary sources of air pollution in the region and projecting and improving public health, air quality, and the global climate. We currently serve more than 7 million residents across the nine Bay Area counties. Within the Strategic Incentives Division, we provide grant funding to target emission reductions from mobile sources with the goal of funding technologies and projects that have the greatest potential to reduce criteria pollutants, toxic air contaminants, and greenhouse gases. Funding is prioritized to help improve air quality in the district's highly impacted communities, disadvantaged communities, and low-income areas. Next slide. So on this slide, you can see the three programs we use to fund electric school buses. Applicants submit just one application, and we assess your eligibility for funding under each of these programs. We determine which program is best for your needs and how to maximize your funding. The Year 22 Carl Moyer program is currently open, as is the Year 22 Transportation Fund for Clean Air. We're expecting Year 4 of the Community Health Protection Program to open soon, and we're currently accepting applications. Eligible projects under the Community Health Protection Program must operate in AB 617, disadvantaged communities or low-income areas. Within the past year, we've been able to co-fund our Carl Moyer and our Community Health Protection Programs with the TFCA program, um, and many schools are benefiting from this policy change with 100% funding for their electric school bus projects. So now is a really great time to apply. Funding is available on a first-come, first-served basis until all funds have been allocated, 
with priority given to projects in communities highly impacted by air pollution. We do also fund low NOx replacements such as natural gas and propane. Some schools opt for a combination of low NOx and electric replacements to meet their fleet's needs. And there are also many other funding opportunities available at other agencies, both here in California and at the federal level. I won't go into them here as Brie will be going over them during the next presentation, but we encourage you to explore all opportunities available. In many cases, you can stack incentives from other funding sources with our programs to maximize your funding. Next slide. So now looking at the basic eligibility requirements for electric school bus replacements. Bay Area public school districts that own their own buses, including under the provisions of the Joint Power Authority, are eligible. Under the Community Health Protection Program, school transportation companies that provide services under contract to Bay Area public school districts, public charter schools, and county offices of education are also eligible. Nonprofit agencies, private schools, and other private companies are unfortunately not eligible for the school bus funding. School buses must transport public school students to and from public school or for school sponsored activities within the area district's boundaries. Within our school bus replacement program, you must exchange an older bus for a new cleaner bus. The maximum funding for electric replacements is 100% of eligible costs up to maximum funding amounts. For projects funded through the Community Health Protection Program, there is no maximum funding amount. For all other projects, the max funding amount is $400,000 per electric bus. The old bus must have a gross vehicle weight rating of 14,001 pounds or greater, and it must be fueled by diesel or natural gas. We also consider buses with a gross vehicle weight rating of 14,000 pounds or less on a case-by-case -case basis, but all replacement buses must be 14,001 pounds or more. Applicants must have owned and operated the old bus for a minimum of 24 months. Next slide. Thank you. The replacement equipment must be new and like for like. An example would be replacing a bus within the same weight range and similar horsepower range. The project must operate within our jurisdiction. Our jurisdiction covers the nine Bay Area counties, excluding some portions of Sonoma County and Solano County. I'll provide a link to a map of the Air District's jurisdiction in the chat shortly, where you can do a quick search to see if your buses are within our boundary. The existing equipment that's being replaced must be destroyed and rendered useless as part of the project. Applicants with diesel buses must provide their truckers report showing their fleet is in compliance with the California Air Resources Board truck and bus regulation. Projects operating in disadvantaged communities or low income areas may be exempt from this requirement. Funding is also subject to the overall project cost effectiveness, which is based on several factors, including the age of the equipment, usage for the previous 24 months, and overall emission reductions that would be realized from the project. Fortunately, school bus projects are usually very cost effective and we often provide 100% funding for electric replacement projects. They're certainly one of our most funded projects. Next slide. We also offer funding for the installation of infrastructure to support project equipment. Schools will often install level two electric chargers and sometimes DC fast chargers. For battery charging infrastructure supporting public school buses, we fund up to 100% of eligible costs. If you want to install a solar or wind power generation system to power your infrastructure, that's also a possibility. The maximum funding for those projects is 65 to 75% of eligible costs, depending on where your project is located. 
We also offer funding for infrastructure only projects. Um, so if you already have electric school buses, but you need funding for infrastructure to support them, we can likely assist with that as well. Next slide, please. So now we'll go over an example of a recently funded school bus project. Um, Mount Diablo Unified School District replaced 16 diesel buses with 16 electric buses and installed 16 charges to support. The project was awarded more than 3 million through the Air District and the, schools, the school received funds from other sources as well. From contract execution to final payment, the project took about one and a half years, including the installation of the infrastructure. The standard time for a project of this size is about one year from contract execution until the completion of the project and payment. Um, during COVID though, projects have been taking a little longer. Next slide. So diving a little deeper into a different example, this school replaced 10 diesel buses with 10 electric buses. Looking at the first row, they had six Type A diesel buses, all with 1999 model year engines. They were replaced with six Type A new electric buses. The average annual mileage per bus was 3,375 miles. They had already secured $175,000 per bus through the Federal Diesel Emissions Reduction Act funding program. And we awarded an additional $90,000 per bus, bringing their total funding for those six buses to 98% of the cost of the bus. They also replaced four Type C diesel buses with four Type C new electric buses. The old buses had 1999 to 2002 engine model years with an average annual mileage of 7,900 miles. These buses received the full $393,132 per bus, covering the full cost of the buses. They applied for infrastructure funding to support their 10 new buses and received $215,000 covering 100% of their costs applied for. Um, pg e also supported their project by upgrading the electricity infrastructure on their end. Next slide. So if you're interested in applying, please start by reviewing the school bus page on the Air District's website. I also highly encourage you to contact me in the early stages and I can go over your basic eligibility, what size and type of new buses you could purchase and potential funding amounts. You'll also want to contact school bus dealerships and identify the replacement equipment you want. You'll need to know this before applying. You should start gathering the required application documents. When you're ready to apply, please do so through our online system. The online application system is found via the links on this slide. One application is submitted and we will assess your eligibility under all our available programs. Next slide, please. And if you're eligible for grant funding, here's what you can expect from the grant process overall. So after grant funding is, is approved by the Air District's Board of Directors, a pre-inspection of the existing equipment will be conducted by the Air District. A contract is drafted and signed by the grantee and the Air District. The Air District then authorizes the dealer and grantee to order and purchase the new equipment. Please note, and this is very important, you cannot order or purchase replacement equipment or start work on any funded infrastructure until an executed contract is in place. Once the new equipment has arrived, the district will inspect the new and old equipment and approve destruction of the old equipment. Any, any funded infrastructure will also be inspected at this time. The old equipment must be sent to a dismantler for destruction within 60 days of the applicant taking possession of the new equipment. 
The dismantler will then destroy the old equipment and the air district will inspect the destroyed equipment and release it for scrapping. Payment is made at this time. You'll be required to operate the new equipment in the Bay Area at a similar usage as the original equipment. You'll also need to report your usage annually for the duration of the project. Next slide, please. So just before I finish up, we also offer funding for other project types, some of which are listed here. If you have another heavy duty fleet of vehicles that you're interested in upgrading to low NOx or electric, or you want to expand bicycle infrastructure on school grounds, then I encourage you to look into our other funding and reach out to us for more information. Next slide, please. So that concludes my presentation. Here's the link to our school bus webpage, as well as my contact information and the contact information for staff members who work on other programs. Reach out to us if you have any questions. I'd be happy to set up a time to discuss your project in detail. Thanks for your time and I'll now hand back to Bree. Thank you, Claire. The Bay Area Air Quality Management District has some great opportunities. You really can't beat 100% of the vehicle costs and 100% of the infrastructure costs if your project is eligible. And now is definitely the time to start thinking about applying because these things definitely take time. So in addition to the opportunities that Claire went through from the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, there are other programs throughout the state and at the federal level. And I'm going to be going into those in more detail to show how you can potentially stack to maximize your savings. Okay, so like you all know by now, I'm Bree Lawrence, Senior Program Manager at GNA, and a program that I manage there is called Funding 360. It is a service that we offer to fleets, to infrastructure providers and OEMs to provide them with information about incentives, not just in California, but throughout the entire country and Canada. It is both technology and fuel agnostic. But of course today that we are here to talk about electric school buses, so that's what I'm going to focus on. I'm going to give you a quick intro into Funding 360, then I'm really gonna get into the examples of programs that are applicable. We're gonna talk about stacking, we're gonna talk about infrastructure, and I'm gonna close with a few tips and tricks. You can go ahead to the next slide. Okay. So the Funding 360 program, this requires a 18 person team that is focused on tracking programs day in and day out. We take it very seriously, as you can see by the statistics that you see on your screen. We have a 90% success rate. We've submitted more than 500 applications on behalf of clients and secured over $800 million. And the process really looks at the projects holistically. When we work with one of our Funding 360 clients, we make sure we understand their goals. So in this case, it would likely be electric school buses in Northern California. We then track incentives that are applicable to that scope and share information proactively. That's really the key is proactively getting intelligence into your hands so that grant opportunities are not a surprise because if it's already open and you're just not hearing about it, you are likely going to have to really hustle to get that application together. We are also fully equipped to provide support throughout the application process, but most important is making sure that projects do get completed and reimbursed, and that is the reporting bubble, which is the fourth step in the process. All right, you can go ahead to the next slide. So let's get into it. Okay, so, this table is showing very high level information about a few programs that are also applicable to school buses in the Bay Area. I've already seen a couple of questions come in about what's available in other parts of the state and other parts of the country. And I'm happy to take those conversations offline with you and we can talk about what funding is available because there likely is a uh, program that would apply in both Southern California, the Northeast and elsewhere. So what you're seeing in this table are a few key elements, but by no means are these all the criteria you need to think about. 
we have the program name, the program status, the maximum for an electric school bus, quick information about stacking, and we're gonna go into that a bit deeper, and then just a keynote about that program that may make it different or that needed to be called out. So again, these are all applicable to the Bay Area, but they are also applicable elsewhere. So just to go into each of these very quickly, we don't have time to go into them all in as much detail as Claire did for Carl Moyer, but we will go through some high level details. Okay, so a couple of these, if you haven't already been thinking about them, now is the time because they do have due dates that are quickly approaching. So in the top row here, we have a federal program. It's important to call that out because sometimes stacking provisions are as simple as can't be stacked with other federal programs. And so knowing, is this a federal program, is important. So this top program is the American Rescue Plan Electric School Bus Rebate. It is a federal program and it operates exactly like the traditional annual DERA school bus rebate, but this is only for electric school buses. That is the key difference. No one else can apply to this program, which isn't the case for some of the other programs on here where other technology and fuel types are eligible. This program is open now. It is closing on November 5th. The maximum per bus is 300,000. It cannot be stacked with other lo local, it cannot be stacked with federal funds, but it can be stacked with local and state funds. And again, it operates like the National Clean Diesel Program. I'm not going to go into the Carl Moyer program again, except just to call out that this is a state level program to California. This is not a federal program. And it is regional in the state of California, but the Carl Moyer program you will find all throughout the state of California. Like Claire said, it's first come first served. And the maximum per bus is 400,000 unless you are in one of those AB 617 communities, in which case there's no cap. The VW program is a program that is made possible through the diesel gate settlement. And this program did open in 2019, back in October, pretty much two years from today, and funding for school buses was oversubscribed immediately. Uh, this program, so this is not currently accepting applications, but there is going to be a second wave. So I do want this to be on your radar. This program would cover up to $400,000 per bus or 75% of the cost, whichever was lower. And Right now, even though the school bus funding is exhausted, funding for other bus types does remain available. A few others here before we go into it a little bit more about stacking. First is the National Clean Diesel Program. So there is a National Clean Diesel Program focused on school buses that is in the row below, but the federal program is friendly towards school buses, trucks, other types of buses and um, off-road equipment. That program is going to be opening in December. It will be competitive and an electric school bus may be covered by an incentive up to 45% of the cost. The one thing to note about DIRA National Clean Diesel Projects are that they do require a public or nonprofit sponsor. So um, that requires you to work with another agency Please keep that in mind. Like I said, there is a National Clean Diesel or DIRA program focused on school bus rebates. This is a program that we see every year. Similar to the program in row one, this is open now and accepting applications through November 5th. But this is um, friendly towards all fuel types and the maximum per bus, even if it's electric, is $65,000. Last but not least is the HVIP program. We could have a half day workshop just on this program. If you have questions about this one or any others, please let me know because this is a lot of into this table. The HVIP program is under development. And although this says opening in November, very recent update, um, it is going to be opening on October 28th, next Thursday, next Thursday, 10 a.m. Mark your calendar. Um, a school bus is eligible for up to $210,000, and that's because there is an enhancement for public school bus fleets 
And there is also an enhancement for operating in a disadvantaged community. All right, so I've got more to go through, so we are gonna boogie on through. Can I get to the next slide, please? All righty, do not let the arrows scare you. When it comes to stacking, take it one program at a time. And something I really wanna express is that you have to look at it from both sides. One program can say, we'll stack with anybody. But if the other program does not say that and says, sorry, we have um, restrictions against stacking with certain programs, you have to make sure it's a go from both sides. So just to go through the arrows quickly, um, and this will be shared. So you will have this as a tool, as a cheat sheet. You'll see here that the federal program up at the top, you have both of the same programs. And if it works, it has an arrow going through it. There's no arrow, there's no opportunity to stack. The federal program at the top, the American Rescue Plan rebate, cannot be stacked with other federal programs. So you're not going to see an arrow going to other federal programs. You will see an arrow going to the Moyer program and to the HFIP program, which are both state level. Federal funding cannot be stacked with the Volkswagen funding, so you're not going to see Volkswagen arrows um, with federal programs. The Bay Area program, like in Claire's example, can be stacked with federal dollars. So you are going to see arrows going to the federally funded programs. You're not going to see it stacking with itself. You're also not going to see it stacking with HVIP because of an HVIP restriction, not a Bay Area restriction. The VW program, unfortunately, cannot be stacked with federal, because federal doesn't allow it, cannot be stacked with state, because the state is in VW aren't allowing it, and it cannot be stacked with HVIP because HVIP doesn't allow it. So just know that about the VW program. And then similarly for the, the two below, um, these federal programs can be stacked with the state level Carl Moyer program and HVIP, and HVIP can be stacked with the federal program, but not the state level programs. So that was going through stacking really in a breeze. But for your particular scenario, let's take it offline and talk about it in more detail because beyond knowing whether or not you can stack, timing and making sure that your applications are submitted in the correct order is going to be that next puzzle piece that needs to be figured out. Okay, next slide, please. Alrighty, so infrastructure. Claire covered the infrastructure for the Carl Moyer program. And I know that Tim is going to do a great job on explaining the infrastructure for the PG&E EV fleet program. So I just want to put a couple of others on your radar. And you really, if you're thinking about buses, need to be thinking about the infrastructure as well. They cannot be separated. So one that's also offered from the Bay Area is the CHARGE program. This program is more focused on public and light duty, but there is an option for private fleet charging. So I wanted to put that on your radar as well because it is available from the Bay Area. And then beyond that, if you're familiar with the HFIT program, then you will probably be happy to hear that the Energy Commission is releasing a program called Energize that's going to be very similar to HFIP, but for the chargers. So it will be first come first served. It will be a voucher style, and it is expected to open in the first quarter of 2022. All right, next slide. Okay, and Claire offered some, some good tips and tricks. And so I wanted to add a couple of others, making sure that you are coordinating with your utility early. So if you're here, you're off to a good start. You're gonna hear from PG&E. And then making sure that you are well ahead of when you want to apply. If you want to place an order today, that means that you would have already have had your application awarded and approved and submitted. So let's think out, what do you want to be ordering six months from now, a year from now? Let's start thinking about that application right now. Also, make sure you do some homework in advance to make sure that your project is competitive. Applications take a lot of time and effort we want to be conservative of, of your time and resources. So look at those scoring criteria, make sure there's a good fit with your project and what the agency is looking for. And then check for deal killers. Um, if a vehicle is out of compliance or there's a lapse in registration, if there's something that is going to get flagged by the agency, look into that in advance so that you're not finding out after the fact. And last but not least, 
take advantage of the resources that are available to you. So whether that's Claire, Tim, or myself, please do not hesitate to reach out to us with any questions. And you can go ahead to the next slide. All right, and so if you do have questions, here is my contact information, and I look forward to working with you more. Okay, so um, now that we've covered some of the most popular resources for school buses and how they can be stacked, we are going to take a deeper dive into infrastructure. So in addition to electrifying your fleet, you'll need to charge that equipment. And um, over the life of your vehicle, using electric buses will be significantly less expensive. The upfront cost of the equipment can be daunting, but PG&E's program is a great opportunity to prepare you. So with that, I will hand it over to Tim. Thank you, Bree. Appreciate that. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Tim O'Neill. I'm an onboarding specialist with PG&E's EV fleet program. Next few minutes, I'll be covering the program. Um, first of all, just for qualifications, I know that when we do these webinars, sometimes folks are from outside PG&E's area, uh, just as a standing point, you do need to be a PG&E electric paying customer in order to qualify for the EV fleet program. It's a five-year program uh, running through the end of 2024. That's the date that you really want to remember uh, for this program. Uh, we have about $236 million. Our goal is to partner with 700 customer sites to get 6,500 new or converted medium or heavy-duty fleet vehicles on the road. You're going to see that uh, in this slide, it's just giving you an example of the types of vehicles that qualify for the program. Of course, all on the top is your on-road. Uh, uh, the main thing here that you want to remember is that, again, it's for medium-duty fleet vehicles. So the, the vehicles have to have a gross vehicle weight rating of 6,001 pounds or more. Uh, anything below that doesn't qualify. You see on the, on the uh, left there in green, that's your medium-duty uh, delivery trucks, uh, uh, distribution trucks, that sort of thing. On the right, uh, you're going to be able to focus on your heavy duty uh, transit vehicles. Uh, also, you see your school buses there. And even though you only see them on that side, yes, your smaller school buses do qualify for the vehicle or for the program as well. On the bottom part of the um, pie, you're going to see all of the off-road equipment that also qualifies. We do have some schools that will, they're going to put into service maybe four school buses, but they also have uh, a maintenance truck, or they've got a food delivery truck or a forklift that's also on site that they can electrify. And you can include those in the program. We can do that at the same time. Uh, and uh, this is really what we look at. When, when a customer uh, talks about their charging infrastructure, this is how pg &E views their charging infrastructure. And really, we're going to spend a little time on this slide talking about who's responsible for what, what pg &E pays for and assistance uh, when schools put into service electric buses or any electric vehicles. But on the right there in green is called TTM. This is the first part of your charging infrastructure, the first of the three. Uh, TTM stands for to the meter. This includes your equipment as the distribution pole off the property, the service drop uh, there down to your transformer sitting there. Uh, and then TTM also includes all of the trenching conduit and conductor from the transformer over to your new meter panel, hopefully sitting near your charging station. Now, uh, customers normally have to pay for the TTM upgrades. This is significant, anywhere from $100,000 to $400,000. But again, through the EV fleet program, pg &E picks up all of these costs free of charge. So that's a significant savings all in itself just for this program. Now, the second part of the charging infrastructure is called BTM. Now, this stands for behind the meter. They're in blue. Now, this is the customer's responsibility. And this includes the customer's new meter panel, plus all the breakers and switch gear in the meter panel, and then any trenching conduit and conductor from the meter panel over to the base of the charging stations. Now, even though it's the responsibility of the customer to purchase and install the BTM, pg &E does pay a BTM incentive through the EV fleet program. And if you look on the bottom right, you'll see there in blue, example, the very bottom block, uh, schools receive, school buses receive a credit of $4,000 per vehicle. So in an example of a school that says, we're gonna put in two buses each year, uh, one, you know, two in 2022, two in 2023, and two 24, for a total of six buses, it's six buses times $4,000, we would pay or commit to paying the customer a BTM incentive of $24,000 for those six buses and for the six chargers that they're gonna putting into service for those six buses. BTM does cap out at 80% of your total out-of-pocket BTM costs. 
but we're not seeing out of the uh, 50 schools that are already in the program, we're not really hitting that. Uh, so uh, they usually have a little bit more of a cost of for a BTM than that $24,000 example. So, um, but just know that as $4,000 per school bus, that's how you'll calculate that. So the third part of the charging infrastructure is of course that in there, that charging station is sitting there. Now schools also qualify for a charger rebate in addition to the BTM incentive. So the charger rebate, as long as you're using a, uh, an approved charger through the qualified um, uh, approved vendor list that's on our website and you'll receive links to all of those, the approved vendor list, how to submit an interest form, uh, more information on the program, you're gonna receive these, this through a, your follow-up email that uh, Ben mentioned in that uh, chat as somebody was asking about, do you get the slides? You will get it and all of those links will be there. But the charger rebate, as long as a school is using a qualified charger, then they will receive the charger rebate. Charger rebate uh, is total up to about 50% of the cost uh, to buy the charger itself. Doesn't include uh, any delivery or um, um, software charges, but it's just the purchase price of the charging station. So just know that about 50% of the charging station uh, will be refunded or, or rebated back to you uh, through the program. Uh, and that is, um, <laughs> Uh, normally, I have to say at this point, if you're a Fortune 1000 customer, you won't qualify for that. But I don't think any of the schools on this call are, uh, would qualify for Fortune 1000. So uh, that's the three areas. Again, TTM, pg &E will purchase, will install, will design, and will pay for everything. BTM, customers will need to purchase and install the BTM, but we will pay a BTM incentive. And the charging station, customers will have to purchase and install the charging station, but pg &E will pay for half the cost of the charger itself. So what's a customer look like when they participate in the program? What do we, what do we ask of them? Well, a few things. Uh, upper left, we ask that they demonstrate uh, their commitment by putting into service at least two vehicles right now. That's not necessarily a deal breaker. If you guys are uh, uh, received a, an Air District grant from, say, the Barrier Back Med uh, for one bus, you can still qualify for the program. Uh, we have a letter of commitment that we have you sign. The second thing on the uh, upper right is we ask that you demonstrate your long-term plan as far as uh, what you're gonna put into service each year. This is very simple. It's, it's three lines of data. It's gonna be a one for each year, 2022, 23, 24, and it'll look like this. 2023, two school buses and two 19 KDB charging stations. 2023, uh, two maintenance trucks and two 11 KDB charging stations and et cetera. So very simple. And we help you work that out because you might not know right now, uh, as both Claire and Bree mentioned, what is your future plans going to look like? What are you going to do in 2023? What are you going to do in 2024? And so when you get on a call with an onboarding specialist, we help uh, go through that and help you set up a plan and, and just uh, establish that demonstrating your, your long-term plan or your deployment schedule. What else do we ask of customers bottom right? is we ask that they uh, own or lease the property where the charger is gonna be installed, that's for obvious reasons, and that uh, you agree to operate and maintain the vehicles and charging stations for a minimum of 10 years. Lastly, bottom left, know that we will be reporting the charger usage data back to the CPUC uh, every quarter, and so uh, you don't have to do anything, uh, customers don't have to worry about that, we'll take care of that for you, but we always like customers to know that we will be reporting the data for them. And basically the, the CPUC says, hey, we, we're, if we're gonna put a quarter million dollars into a project, we really wanna know that the chargers are being used, those emissions are being reduced, that's where that comes about. So uh, understand that we can't just let anybody on this call apply for the program, and you're gonna see in the next slide that we immediately a hire an engineering design firm, we put money into your project, we put resources and time, and so we can't really do that for just anybody who's curious. So for that reason, this, this uh, we can only accept applications when customers are ready to move forward. And that means that they already have uh, invoices, that they've already ordered their vehicles and paid for them, or that they have an approved vehicle grant. That's the two things that it's what I call the golden ticket. If you have that, you have a golden ticket, you can apply into the program, and we can actually start working on your design. So what else does a customer need to be ready to uh, submit their EV fleet application? Uh, you need to have that vehicle electrification plan that I just mentioned, that, that deployment schedule. You need to have it down of what you're willing to commit to putting into service each year through the end of 2024. 
You also need to know not just the address of where you're going to have your charging stations, but you need to know the location because when the design team comes out, they're going to ask you, where would you like your charging stations? You're going to have to say up against that fence line in front of those parking stalls. Great. How many? Uh, we want five 19 kW charging stations, blah, blah, blah. So you need to know the details of where, where you want your plan for your charging stations and where they're going to be installed on site. Also, you need to know that you will have some out-of-pocket BTM costs. Uh, Claire covered a really good example of uh, both uh, it was Mount Diablo, which was also in our program, which we funded um, and took care of their charging infrastructure for those 16 buses. And that the second program that she talked about for the 10 buses, same thing. Uh, but uh, some of those customers will have some out-of-pocket um, um, BTM costs. So you can try to get those covered by getting a, a, an infrastructure grant. And you can stack all of our dollars on top of any of those dollars. So uh, ours is not really considered, pg es program is not considered uh, a grant. It's just a program. So we, we, you can stack ours with any of those programs that are out there. The other thing is you do need to have leadership approval, number six there. We have to make sure that you have all decision makers on board. Uh, what we don't want to do is uh, have you submit an application. We go through, we do a design, we get a contract together for you, submit it off, and somebody in the organization says, oh, no way, cancel the whole thing. We just waited, wasted a lot of your time and ours. So uh, with that, let's talk about what you're going to go through once you're ready to submit that application. There's two phases to pg es EV fleet program. The first on the left there is called preliminary design phase, takes about three to five months. And then the second phase on the right is called final design and execution, takes about six to eight months. If you add these up, you can see that really it takes us nine to 13 months after you submit your application uh, until we can have completed uh, charging stations ready to go for your, for your buses. So with that being said, you really need to, you saw that uh, Claire mentioned the, the one project there took about a year and a half. So you can imagine that if it takes us a year to get your charging infrastructure in, uh, you, you need to get us, let us know as soon as you receive a grant so we can start helping you walk through the program, uh, setting up your design. But let's talk about the path you'll go on. So first of all, as soon as you submit that EV fleet application, number one, uh, pg is gonna hire an engineering design firm. That firm is gonna contact you and set up a site walk. They're gonna come out and uh, they're gonna uh, discuss with your team where you want your charging stations, how big, how many, all of that stuff. They're also gonna take a look at your, your transformer on site. They're gonna look at the capacity of the transformer, make sure it has enough capacity. If we have to upgrade the transformer, that's okay. Remember a few slides back, I said that we handle the TTM. We will upgrade your transformer for free. We'll do that. So we'll take care of all that, but they'll need to take a look at some of that. They go back to the office, work for a couple of weeks, put your preliminary design together. Then number five, they submit your design back to pg &E. We go through and once we, once we approve that design and it's everything that you wanted it to be, uh, we put a contract together there, number six. Contract will have all of your terms and conditions. It'll have the preliminary design. It'll have all of the incentives and rebates we're committing to paying you. And it'll also have your deployment schedule that you're committing to for your vehicles through the end of 2024. Once you sign that contract and return it back to pg &E, we flipped you to the other side of this orange line. You're now in final design and execution. Your first thing we'll do is assign a construction project manager for you, and they'll be your primary contact moving forward. The first thing they're gonna do is make sure we don't need to make any changes, which 99% of the time we don't. They stamp final design on it and say, you're good to go. Then they're gonna try to make contact with your BTM contractor that's gonna be doing your BTM work just to make sure that the uh, coordination is there. They know where to set that new meter panel because that's where pg and is gonna be bringing the power to the, the panel. So they need to make sure that they're on board of that. At that time, your BTM contractor is gonna go back. They're gonna start pulling permits for the BTM work. They're gonna order the materials. They're gonna schedule their crews at the same time pg and project manager is going to be doing the same thing on the TTM side, ordering our materials, pulling our permits, scheduling our crews. Hopefully in six months or less, uh, or hopefully right around there, number 13, pg &E, all the BTM work will be done, all the TTM work will be done, and pg &E will be able to energize your new meter panel. At that point, number 14, you'll be able to energize your charging stations. You'll do a communication test because these will all be smart chargers communicating either phone lines or, or wireless. And at that point, you'll, you'll be off and running with your buses, uh, enjoying life. And then uh, at that point, you can go ahead and turn back, submit back to pg and &E all of your paid invoices so that we can pay you those BTM incentives and any charter rebates that, that you were qualifying for. 
Uh, this is the end of the EV fleet program. I actually, uh, I, I love the fact that Bree and Claire gave you guys tips and tricks at the end. I don't have tips and tricks, but I have two bonus items for you. And the first bonus item I have for you is pg &E has a new business electric vehicle charging rate. And that, I'm not going to go through the rate and everything, but just know that that's important. We're, we're seeing that most uh, customers, including schools, are receiving uh, about a 25% discount on the cost of their electricity for their vehicles as regards to the rest of their facility. And uh, now you can take advantage uh, of super off peak charging middle part of the day. Most schools have their buses come back after the morning run and can really charge on this super off peak 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. And, and they can actually get their discount even lower. They can pay you know 30% less than what they're paying on the regular PG&E rate. Uh, but the important thing and the one important the, the thing that I have to point out for this is to get on the business electric vehicle charging rate, you have to have your, your buses or any of your electric vehicles on a separate pg e meter than the rest of the facility. And that's so the pg e can prove to the CPUC, yes, they all deserve this discount at this point because they are on this, um, uh, they are all on a separate pg e meter. That's why under the EV fleet program, we have you install a new meter panel for your vehicles and they all qualify for the business EV rate. The second bonus I have, I have for you is a tool called the uh, EV Fleet Savings Calculator. If you go to fleets.pg.com, and I'm going to include those links in that follow-up email to you so you'll have access to this, you can have access to, to this tool. Very powerful tool. Uh, this is not the actual tool. It's a, a static display, but when you're here, you're going to be able to decide. You can select uh, school buses, how many buses, how many miles per day they drive, how many days per week, what size chargers you have, and what hours you charge. Once you have save, it'll update this. This is a great tool because this will show you the example here that I'm, I'm showing is this one truck operating 100 miles per day, five days a week. We know that the diesel version of this, uh, if you look at that black box, they use, if they're paying $3.10, which is the fuel price that you can move up or down, which is very specific to you guys and how much you pay. Uh, that but that truck will use $16,000 worth of diesel per year. The same electric version of this truck will use $8,000 there in yellow of electricity per year. Obviously, 16,000 diesel, 8,000 electric shows you an $8,000 per year savings, which is the summary up in the upper left. So this one vehicle operating in this manner will show $8,000 per year savings. So if you need to show this to the, the school board or the superintendent of the fuel savings or the, the total savings as far as going to electric buses. This is a great tool to help you do this. Not only will it show you your fuel savings, but it'll show you what you, what you will receive as far as low carbon fuel standard credits. This tool will also do this, it'll pop up. This example here, this one truck, not only will they receive an $8,000 per, uh, per year savings in fuel, they're gonna receive $14,000 worth of LCFS credits. And by the way, I will include a link in, your, in that email going out to you for a webinar that we did through ACT News uh, recently on LCFS credits. So if you're unfamiliar, that's a great webinar to look at, helps you understand how the process works and how you would monetize those LCFS credits. There's other tabs on here that's uh, on electricity, oops, on electricity, uh, vehicles, and it basically will give you more information about the scenario that you set up here, chargers. And the last tab I'll show you uh, how we get to this 51 tons of emissions reduced. This is huge because this is what we're all here for. We're talking about these, uh, these goals in California of emissions reductions. And so this tool will do that. And that last tab, when you click on emissions, it shows you all the details of how we get to 51 tons of emissions. That might be one of the more important areas if your school district is really focused on the sustainability aspect of this. That's it. So it's a great tool for you to, to be able to play with and, 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 and toy with. Um, the other thing I'm going to say on the last part is in order to, uh, there's a, a going to be a link called an interest form, EV fleet interest form. And all you got to do is submit that interest form and an onboarding specialist such as myself will give you a call back in a day or two. And we can get in some details about your site, your, your specific project, where you're at, send some assistance as far as on, on moving it along. So um, that's it for me. At this point, we're going to go ahead and I believe we're going to get into some q and A. I I think I'm going to hand this back over to uh, Bree and she'll run us through that. Great. Thank you so much, Tim. We are going to turn to questions now. We have about 10 minutes. So if we run out of time, please do reach out to the panelists. Our email addresses are going to be in the chat box in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. 
Okay, so time is of the essence and we have gotten some great questions in the chat. So we are going to try to power through with brevity and vigor. Okay, so Tim, because you were just talking about the program, there were a few that came in. So let's power through some of these. One of sure. them has to do with the LCFS credits. Does a participant in the program still have access to those credits? Yes, the rule is, is uh, the way that California Air Resources Board or CARB puts it, if you own the charging station, you own the credits, they will send them to you. And there's a process you'll go through as far as registering your, your, your charger with CARB. You're gonna report back in how much usage you have on the, on the charger uh, each month, and then they will send you the, the credits. And there's a process of monetizing those credits going on to the, uh, on to the uh, open market. And that's within that link, view that, that webinar. But if you own the charging station, you own that. So be aware as a school that's looking at a third party that comes in and says, hey, we'll do this for you. We'll own the charging stations, we'll install them. That's a great process, but understand if they own the charging stations, you will not earn the LCFS credits, only if when you own the charging stations. Very good, thank you for clarifying. And Claire, a question came in, are the incentives and grants that you discussed available statewide? Uh, yeah, the Calm Lawyer program is available statewide and it's usually administered through um, your relevant air district. Um, and then the TFCA program, other air districts have similar programs under, under different names. So I just encourage you to get in touch with your lo local air district if you're not within um, the Bay Area and, and they, they should be able to point them in the right direction. Great, thank you. And that addresses another question that came in about funding resources in Southern California. So just like Claire said, there is a Carl Moyer program in Southern California. There is also um, a sister agency to the South Coast Air Quality Management District called the MSRC that also provides funding opportunities. So the short answer is yes. Several of the programs that we talked through today are also applicable to Southern California, and there are a couple of additional programs down there. Okay. And Bree, if I if I can also just mention, even though this is a PG&E webinar, yes, our sister utilities, SoCal Edison and San Diego Gas Electric, do have similar programs as with EB Fleet, and they can assist you with with going into that. Simply Google their 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 email or their uh, their websites, and they have similar programs. Great call out. Great call out. Okay, we did have a couple of questions that are more process oriented. So one is, does the school district pay the dealer up front and then get reimbursed? And Claire, I will I'll start with you. Your thoughts, and I can add my sure. Name. Yeah, so for our programs, typically, yes, the school district will pay the dealer and then the school would get reimbursed by us. Um, some dealerships are flexible and they, they'll be happy to pay for the buses on the school's behalf. And then at the time of payment, we'll issue a two-party check. Um, so it just depends on your dealer and what you work out with them. We can definitely do that on our behalf, but usually the school will pay the dealer. And the only one that I would add that's a bit of an anomaly is the HVIP program, which is a point of sale transaction. So the school mm. would never pay the full price of the school bus. It would be reduced from their um, invoice and their purchase. But for the most part, to Claire's point, it is reimbursed. It is full, paid fully up front and then later reimbursed after the vehicle has been delivered. Okay, Alrighty. Hey, Bree, can I add on to that one? Please do. So, so for the infrastructure, um, as I mentioned, we will be paying uh, rebates and incentives, but yes, the school will actually have to pay for the infrastructure upgrades for that those BTM upgrades up front if they don't have an, an infrastructure grant, and then we would pay the, the incentives and the rebates after the fact, after everything's done. So they may have those costs. Okay, very good to know, very good to know. And we did get a question here um, just about the time it takes to do these. So um, it says these infrastructure projects are a bit daunting or seem daunting for a small school district with limited staff resources. Do you find that these projects are a steeper learning curve compared to other construction projects that a school would normally undertake? So Claire, Tim, I don't know if from previous projects you want to um, speak to that question. Uh, I'd be happy to as far as, uh, so yeah, I mean, it's something most most of the folks on this call are, are not into trenching and laying conduit 
uh, or even operating or, or installing charging stations. You guys are either maintaining your fleet or, your, or, or some of you, I, I bet, are organizing your bus schedule and, and, and communicating with the drivers. And we know that. And so that's why I say get a hold of an onboarding specialist uh, at, uh, at pg and &E. We can help guide you through this. And yes, it does seem at first like, oh my gosh, how am I going to do this? But uh, like I said, we've got over 50 schools already in the project or in the program. And they're doing great. And so we can help you get through this. Between Claire uh, on, on that end talking about uh, the, you know, the, um, the, the incentives for infrastructure and then the assistance that we offer you, we, we help you get you through this. Yeah, and then I'll just add to that um, from the school bus side, I think that the, the time commitment and getting all the documents together is probably one of the biggest barriers. It's not typically the cost because we offer 100% of funding. Um, and so just, just echoing what Tim says, reach out to us, we can help you, um, can answer all your questions and, and make sure that you're doing exactly what you need to do to get through it as quickly as possible. And I will echo both of you. That's one of the main goals of, of the GNA team is to help these awardees make it through the reporting process and ultimately get reimbursed. So please do take advantage of, of the folks on this call and, and reaching out for assistance. Okay, so there are several vehicle to grid uh, questions peppered throughout the Q&A. And so, um, Tim, I was thinking I could turn this over to you just for, sure. if you have insights into any real examples of V2G happening. Um, well, this will be a short answer, answer because pg &E is, uh, is is just developing our V2G program. Vehicle to grid is, is those that don't know, that's where you can actually, um, take power from your buses while they're sitting idle maybe in the summer and you can put that uh, you can flow that power back onto the grid and get paid for it uh, that's a dem demand response type of program and it's a great program schools are really going to be able to take advantage of it well because they can uh, use those buses as stationary batteries to put uh, charge up your batteries during the cheap time and then dump the power back on the grid during the expense time make some money uh, it's in development right now probably going to be about 12 months maybe even 18 months out before all of the final regulations are completed uh, that we have to file through the cpuc we're doing a pilot right now but we don't have a lot of information on that simply because it's just not an active program yet soon to come okay all right i think i'm going to try to squeeze in just one more here and then we're going to have to call it but this is a question just about the ownership requirements to be eligible for a grant so are there any opportunities if you've only owned the bus for a year so for folks in this situation i will call out that the hfit program does not have a ownership requirement there's a scrappage required and then um Moyer and the federal programs do have a 24 month requirement. Uh, the VW program, we have seen that dropped to a year for their solicitations for trucks and other project types. And so before that next round comes out, it's worth checking to see if only a year is required. So I know that I am about to close this out, but Claire and Tim, any last thoughts, words of wisdom before we end the webinar? I'll let Claire go. Just in case you apply, we <laughs> we um we have a lot of money and we we want to give it out to people and we want to get all these buses transferred over to electric. So reach out to me. Yeah, the two I'll give is number one, if you're in the Bay Area, yes, not all air districts uh, have this much funding for available. And so definitely, I mean, and as Bree pointed out, there's a lot of other programs out there that you can stack and some have availability, but many don't. So if you're in the barrier, just definitely go for that. But the second thing is, as soon as you receive your vehicle grant, get a hold of pg &E, let us know. Don't wait until you have three months before your buses show up and say, hey, pg &E, I need some charging stations. And we're going to say, well, you, you've got about nine months that, for us to go through the entire process to get the installation done. So get a hold of us uh, early and, uh, and get, get information. Same thing with, with Bree. If you guys don't know, definitely get a hold of GNA and say, where do I start? They're a great resource also. Great. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Claire. We are out of time. Please reach out to us with other questions. I think there's one last slide. Great. And look out for look out for a follow-up email with the link to this recording and other resources. Thanks so much for joining today, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thanks a lot.